Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, I'm the RSA's Chief Executive and it's my great pleasure to welcome today's guest, Mariana Matsukatu. Uh, have I pronounced it right, Mariana? Perfect, was... perfect. Oh. What a relief. I mean, I've known you all these years, but I still think I'm capable of getting your name wrong. It's terrible. Well, it's Italian, but it sounds Japanese and it means Christmas tree in Japanese. How's that? <laughs> great, what a great start. Uh, Mariana is Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Founding Director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public purpose. She's written and researched about theories of value in the economy, the role of the state as a risk taker, an innovator, innovation-led inclusive growth and mission-based policies. Much of Mariana's work is particularly helpful at a time like this, this COVID-19 crisis, as we think about routes to map out of this crisis into a more sustainable and inclusive economy beyond the emergency. So before we get into all of that, Marina, how are you? How is the crisis treating you? I'm good. Uh, what can I say? I've got four teenagers with me in this lockdown household. So it's both great in the sense we laugh a lot, but we're also all Italian, so argue a lot. And I think my neighbours are getting worried. <laughs> how's, the home, how's the homeschooling going? Uh, it's more, it's, no, I mean, they're all very independent, but we've started to become, uh, how do you say, obsessed with playing cards at night as well as binging on certain series. It's more the card games that are uh, occupying my um, thinking, how to beat them. I very much enjoyed the Ofsted inspector who on Twitter gave himself uh, an inspection report for how good he'd been as a home school educator and he gave himself zero for everything because he'd proven to be completely incompetent when it came to home education. Right. Well, we, we made a schedule and put it on the fridge in the beginning and have done none of it. I, I was very ambitious. I said, eight o'clock, we all do yoga together. One of my kids did it with me once. But the big thing is we watch the news together. I think that that's a big innovation for us. We all watch the seven o'clock Channel 4 news and then comment on it during dinner. So that's a very different way to absorb news as, you know, for teenagers at least. Well, it's great to get that kind of picture of your of, of how you're dealing with it. Now, on to the crisis. You've written a lot uh, already, and I think, uh, as usual, you're already being influential. You've talked about this crisis bringing to light three kind of related crises, um, a health crisis, which is engendering an economic crisis, and, of course, that is all set against the background of already existing climate crisis. And I read a statistic today which I found particularly sobering, which was that of course, emissions will go down this year, but the amount emissions will go down this year is probably only just a little bit more than how much they ought to have gone down anyway in order to keep us on track in terms of responding to the climate emergency. So talk to us about those three emergencies and how they're interacting in this crisis and, and how that helps us think about where we go next. Sure. So first of all, I see them as interrelated and we shouldn't forget that just you know two months ago or even less, we weren't clapping uh, you know, the health services, we were clapping the firefighters, for example, in both Australia and in places like California or the flood fighters in Venice. And so the climate crisis and this health crisis and the financial crisis, which was not that long ago, are kind of coexisting. And I think they all, to some extent, are also caused by our very problematic way of thinking about how to construct our economies in our society. And I've written about this for a long time, that the notion that we're just there to fix a problem when it occurs, and by we, I mean any sense of policy, so the kind of strategic element of how we construct our world is just there to fix something, is kind of the starting point where I think a lot goes wrong. Um, if we think of the climate crisis, we know now that it's not a, enough to just have something like carbon taxes or to create incentives to change behaviors. We also have to reimagine what kind of society we want to be living in, you know, so carbon neutrality or building sustainable cities. And similarly with health, the problem is you can't now just throw money at the health services, which have for such a long time been starved not only of funds, and in the UK it's, it's close to a billion, I think, that the NHS itself has suffered in terms of cuts since 2015. So it's not just about you know, throwing money again at a service that is so important, but also rethinking how could it be that we just forgot how valuable that type of service is. 
and that we're constructing economies where we're also, if you want, undervaluing certain services that only during a crisis we realize are so important. And what does that mean for how we also distribute and create other types of value in the economy? And the problem that we have now is that this notion that we have to immediately uh, create some solutions which of course we do, we need you know, daily, weekly, monthly, long-term, but also immediate solutions, is part of that problem if we don't also embed within these solutions a vision for what kind of economy we actually want to be constructing. And every time I say economy, of course, there's not just the economy, but as an economist, that's what I'll talk about. So going back to normal, which we often hear is what we're trying to do, is of course problematic when the normal itself perhaps got us where we are. So I think this is really the challenge, which is to be very ambitious um, with the immediate way that we construct the remedies, whether it's the way we're currently trying to help businesses, the way we're trying to help particular areas, whether it be a city and households and workers embed within the way that we structure those remedies, a vision for the kind of economy we want to build. Um, and I can go into this in a bit of detail, actually, if you'd like, because I'm currently working with different countries on COVID task forces, but I'll let you come in before this becomes a monologue. Well, that was exactly what I wanted to ask you, uh, Mariana, because, you know, your, 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 your books, your academic work is, is incredibly powerful, but I'm really interested in where you think this argument is right now, because I know that as well as being an academic, you also work very closely with policymakers. And I sense that, you know, for example, in Whitehall, there is a finely balanced argument between the kind of back to normal people and the kind of green recovery or different recovery or build back better uh, yeah. people. So where is that argument poised? Obviously, it's different in different places. And what do you think will be the kind of determinants of whether or not it is an attempt to get back to normal as quickly as possible or an opportunity to go on a different trajectory? Sure. So, I mean, the immediate problem with the normality is that, you know, on the one hand, we do need all sorts of normality, even just being able, if I see you, to hug you and to shake your hand as opposed to say, stay away, stay two meters away. But the, you know, the main thing about normality is people want to go back to work. They want to be earning. They want to be, you know, seeing their colleagues. Families want to be able to have their normal lives. The problem is that on the economic side, the normal was a very problematic way of growing. I mean, what caused the financial crisis, for example, was not a lack of growth, but the direction of that growth. What is causing the climate crisis is not a lack of growth, but the direction. So this issue of directionality is fundamental. Uh, now, let me just give you a quick example so I go right down to the practical before we can come back to the vision. One of the very uh, concrete questions that governments have right now is the way that bailouts are happening to particular sectors or just let's just call it help to particular types of firms in particular uh, types of industries. And one of the things I've been arguing for, actually for a long time pre-COVID, is that we should not see the state as sort of a handout machine, whether that be through different types of tax incentives or when the steel sector, for example, comes and asks to be bailed out, the government should not be there to simply say, you know, save a company or increase its profits, but really ask itself, you know, how can this company itself also become sort of part of the solution in terms of the kind of society we're trying to build? So very recently, just before COVID, I was writing about what happened in Germany with the bailout to the steel sectors, that there was conditions attached to the bailout so that steel had to reduce its material content in Germany. And in the process has actually become one of the most innovative modern steel sectors in the world. And so currently, one of the challenges is, I think, is both to obviously help quickly companies that need help, not to have big philosophical conversations, but because there are existing contracts there when bailouts or different types of assistance occurs, we can write conditions in to these contracts that are both fair, but also quite ambitious. And it doesn't have to be thousands of pages long. By the way, the contracting that NASA had when it did its procurement to get to the moon in its uh, you know, work with GE, Motorola, and Honeywell, these were very short and very ambitious and lots of private sector activity helped you know, governments get to the moon and back again in one generation. And there's lots to learn from that. But just coming back to the conditionalities, there's different ways that this is now being talked about. Denmark very recently, just less than I think two weeks ago, talked about the need to not give out money to companies, for example, that have used tax havens. Um, Austria has talked about 
the need not to give bailouts to airlines, their own airline, um, unless they commit over a certain period of time to reducing their carbon emissions. And haven't we, Marianne, haven't we already failed that test? I think I, I've heard yeah. at least that we have yeah. given money already to the airline industry in this exactly. country without any conditions exactly. being applied at all. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a massive failure. It's, it's a failure because it's, it's actually, if, if anything, just a massive failure of imagination of what we can do as a society. This concept of stakeholder governance. I don't know if you were in Davos this year. I tried to avoid it, but I somehow find myself there uh, giving talks. But the big talk this year in Davos was about purpose. You know, the Business Roundtable talked about it in that famous letter they wrote at the end of the summer. Stakeholder governance instead of maximizing shareholder value. And then when there is the opportunity to walk the talk, all of a sudden no one's in the room, right? So, I mean, my view, and I know this is gonna sound harsh and I have been attacked in different places, including Twitter when I say this, so I'll try to put it mildly. I actually think that, you know, uh, uh, help at least to the large corporates, it is different with small enterprises and we can talk about that separately, but with the large corporates, including, you know, EasyJet as an airline, if they say we just want bailouts with no conditions attached, my approach would be, all right, see ya, come back when you change your mind. <laughs> because the point is not to you know, just present a completely harsh line, no, we're not gonna help you. Of course we wanna help you, but you will also help us. So government is there elected by citizens. Citizens care about certain things like the climate. We have the sustainable development goals, 17 of them. That will just remain chat unless we find different ways, including in the multiple crises we have, because again, this is not the only crisis, there was the financial crisis where lots of money was given out without conditions. And what we found there was that all that, for example, liquidity that was infused into the system, and we're talking trillions of dollars worth, a lot of it just ended up back inside the financial sector. So we basically had finance, financing, finance. It wasn't accompanied by ambitious sort of new creation of opportunities in the real economy. And this is what we need to learn from this time around. Of course, we need to infuse the system with liquidity. There is a money tree we've discovered, but how you, how you structure that needs to be very ambitious. And this is the irony, the same governments that before were saying, no, sorry, we can't spend, there is no money tree. Now we're just giving it away without conditions attached. Um, and the truth must be somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think we have discovered again, as by the way, we always discover during wars, no one says, oh, there's no tax revenue. We're not gonna go to Afghanistan. Somehow money appears when countries want to go to war. And we really need to start applying that kind of creation of money and outcomes, what I call mission oriented focus to all the social you know, slash wicked problems, not just the technological and kind of army driven ones. So again, those that I think fall underneath these sustainable development goals. The health services, have suffered huge amounts, I think, of not only cuts, but a fall in their remit, what we actually want the welfare state to be providing, rethinking the welfare state, not just kind of sticking to a romanticized version of, say, you know, what Beveridge had in mind. And I know your own work, uh, Matthew, at the RSA has very much been thinking about the future of work, which is tied to the future of the welfare state. And I think this is a moment when governments, again, are being asked to come in and save the system again and again, that if you don't do it with an imagination of what government is for, what health services are for, what all sorts of different services are for, including, by the way, public education. My four kids are all at home, and I won't go into the details, but I have found quite lacking the ability of the public education system to really make sure, for example, that the digital divide um, you know, it doesn't come in between certain types of children and students of different ages learning versus the ones like our children who are probably overstimulated <laughs> at home. Um, anyway, that's a whole other conversation, but there's all sorts of ways in which government can really use its full capacity, including using procurement, right? So government as purchaser, not just government as investor to really fuel those bottom up innovations for online education, for hygiene, for personal protection equipment, for ventilator production, but especially for the ambitious goals that have to do with what kind of health do we want our economy to have? Well, the question then is, uh, Mariana, why is this not happening? So Dominic Raab went, I think, to St. Petersburg summit, and he said, you know, the recovery has got to be a green recovery. And yet, at the same time, his government is handing out money to the airline industry with no conditions. So there seems to be this kind of disconnect between 
a story that the state is kind of telling, is saying now, which fits in more with your ideas. I'm on the government's industrial strategy. There is an industrial strategy. So it's as if we kind of recognise this, but yet the state, or certainly the British state, can't actually live up to it, 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 it state. So what, what's, what's, the, what's the barrier acting in the way of the state appreciating and using the power that it's got to shape the economic outcomes we want? Um, well, first of all, there's big differences between governments and different even states within certain nations, like in the U.S. states are interacting in different ways with the crisis. Um, but on this particular issue around the conditionalities, you know, the examples I gave of Denmark doing it with the tax havens, Austria doing it with the airlines, Elizabeth Warren really bringing the notion to the fore with her idea that we cannot be just, you know, bailing out companies that, for example, have shown to be more interested in share buybacks than reinvesting their profits back into whether it's research and development or better working conditions. That conversation is being had. Some countries are taking action and some are not. And, you know, what that heterogeneity, I mean, I'm, I'm always in some ways inspired when I see differences. Otherwise, we all tend to think that there's these deterministic forces, you know, technological change, globalization, or these crises that come our way. And when you see actually that there's differences in how businesses are reacting to it in countries, you remember that strategy matters. I don't know if you remember, sorry, a little parentheses. It's my favorite bit in Marx. It was in um, one of his writings where he said, what's the difference between a spider web, you know, that magic of the spider web, you just see this perfect thing and a kind of, you know, crappy little house that some not very good architect makes. Why is the architect in the end superior to the spider? And he says, because there was thinking, there was actually forward thinking, there was a plan, there was a strategy, no matter how bad it was, at least thinking matters ahead of time. And, you know, the difference is where there's a will there's also a way. I mean, what we're seeing in certain countries which have an ambition for governments to do what I'm talking about, which is to be active co-creators and co-shapers of growth so we actually get inclusive and sustainable growth, they are asking themselves these questions. I would argue that this particular administration um, hasn't yet in the UK made statements even as ambitious as those that, you know, Theresa May made in terms of inclusive growth that day that she stepped outside on her first day in the office, you might remember, outside of Downing Street. And she made a real plea around, you know, inclusion and inequality in the country, which in theory could have really set a strategy for where the economy went. Now, I won't comment on what I actually think happened later, but the point is that's a vision. We haven't heard yet much vision in this administration beyond the Brexit you know, beyond Brexit as kind of this big thing that had to be done by any means necessary. And then what happened was as soon as it was semi done, you know, COVID appeared. So it's really hard, I think, when you don't have a vision and a strategy to then have the confidence, the ability, or even the you know ability to catalyze your different ministries to act in a cohesive way to structure your policies in a way that actually brings you to, you know, in a direction. In the institute I set up at UCL, <clears throat> which you mentioned in the beginning, the reason it has public purpose at the center of the title is that we begin with this premise that, you know, growth has not just a rate, but a direction. If we want the direction to be inclusive and sustainable, that has to filter down to the everyday operations of what government does, how you structure grants, loans, procurement, the degree to which you talk between ministries, the ability to bring inside the treasury that issue of directionality so you don't just have all the interesting stuff in the minister, you know, the Ministry of, of um, Innovation or the Department of the Environment. You bring that directionality to the center of how the treasury itself thinks about growth so that even the green book would kind of reflect that in terms of how we evaluate public investments. I think, you know, the opportunity definitely is there for the UK government in this particular moment we're seeing them a bit lost, I think, and really falling behind in terms of the conversations that are being had globally. But, you know, things can change. You know, there's, there's, every day we hear about different policy announcements. I'm very much hoping the UK gets on the bandwagon on this issue of stakeholder governance of a crisis. So as someone who used to work in, in number 10, people often kind of say the government thinks this and the government thinks that. And, 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 you know, of course, governments do have ideologies and uh, predispositions, but often what you're responding to is the quality of the ideas that are brought in to you. So I wonder, I mean, we, we're talking to local authorities that are thinking about, you know, shovel-ready green recovery schemes, which they can bring forward. And, and, and what I'm hearing is that what the government wants is they want stuff that can happen quickly because 
the need to get this recovery moving. I think we're still underestimating the scale of kind of carnage in the economy, which is unfolding as we speak. But secondly, they want stuff that can demonstrate rate on rate of return in a reasonable kind of time frame. So is it incumbent upon whether it's local authorities or social enterprises or even academics to be putting together the kinds of proposals which 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 will work which have that character, uh, characteristic of working quickly, but also, as you say, going in the direction that you want to go in. Because there was a lot of talk about that in, 20, in 2008, 2009, but I think some people looking back on that say, actually, the schemes weren't really ready in the way they needed to be. Interesting. So you, you mentioned before the industrial strategy, and both you and I have worked on that. I worked on that before the industrial strategy even came out. I was quite proud to have convinced Greg Clark to make sure it was challenge oriented and not just a list of sectors. And so the industrial strategy that did come out in November 2017 had these really ambitious challenges at the core of how the government was going to approach not just growth, but also specifically how it interacted with industry. So instead of having the old list of sectors, financial services, automobiles, um, aerospace, creative industries, um, what was the other one, life sciences, the idea was what are your big goals around clean growth, the future of mobility, the opportunities that big data present to us, uh, you know, the uh, healthy aging, and how do you transform these kind of bold areas into missions, right? So we set up, David Willits and I, a two-year project with the government, right? Because I think we have to work with elected officials. We don't just come in as academics or, or you know, policy consultants say, oh, do that, do that, with people who were really wed to thinking about the industrial strategy and help them transform these four challenges that I just mentioned into missions. I'm going to do something which you might get mad at me because we didn't plan this ahead of time. I'm going to share a screen just to show you what I'm talking about here. Um, Actually, I'm not going to do that because I think I, I've done this before and then I show people really embarrassing things on my computer. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, well, um, I was going to show you the future of mobility one just to say that, you know, there there really was a very interesting uh, discussion across departments because we shouldn't forget that the really interesting thing that government does is often when it goes across departments. So just to give you an example, the innovation budget in the UK up until recently was about 10 billion. As soon as you start changing how government operates in the day to day, you can leverage in not only private money by crowding that in, but different types of public money. So just the procurement budget of the Department of Transport in the UK approaches the 40 million mark, the 40 billion mark, right? So instead of just having your innovation budget as this cute little pocket that you might do some interesting things, you start looking across the departments in terms of how that purchasing occurs and automatically it just becomes, you know, multiplied by a lot. And those plans are there. We worked with the government for two years to do that. There is an industrial strategy in 2017. The problem is in the UK, and I've been here now 20 years, is that when you don't really have confidence of what government is for, then every time you have a new election, you know, policies come, policies go, the departments themselves change name constantly. So the current department, Bayes, Business, uh, Environment, Industrial Strategy, since I've been here has changed name three times, just calculate the cost of the stationary <laughs> change each time. And what it does, it kind of reeks of a lack of confidence, again, of what the role of the state is and how it interacts with industry. And I just think, for now at least, just to talk again really concretely, we have a huge challenge with COVID. It's presented as challenges around, again, the digital divide question in terms of how kids are being educated, around loneliness of elderly and others in their homes. Not all of us are like myself with all these teenagers bothering me in the house. Many people are alone in the house. Um, and of course, the, this concrete ch health challenge in terms of actually producing the vaccines, the personal protection equipment and the health services, all those could be different opportunities to think about how we approach growth and the way that government itself interacts with business, not only in terms of the conditionalities we were just talking about, but real collaboration. You know, this, this word public private partnership. Underlying that is this concept of a system, an ecosystem. But ecosystems, if you speak to any biologist, they'll tell you, well, what kind of ecosystem? Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic? Is it predatory? Is it parasitic, right? So how we actually structure these PPPs, the last P, the partnerships in a moment like this crisis to tackle together, to really collaborate, to solve all the different challenges we have from the digital to the health 
is, I think, going to be a great test, a litmus test for what kind of capitalism we're constructing here. And I come back to this notion that there's different ways of doing it. I have a new piece in the New York Times, but also more recently in Project Syndicate, just on the vaccine production. That itself is a test for how public and private come together. We can govern that process in really problematic ways in terms of the pricing, the access, the IPR around it, or in really positive ways that are driven by a concept of the public good. Um, and it could go either way. I mean, a recurrent theme in what you're saying, Mariana, is, is the, the need to see these externalities, these synergies to, to, to join up. And you know, as a member of the Industrial Strategy Council, you know, what I observe is an industrial strategy, which in itself is, is fine. And, you know, it's important that the government sticks with it and sticks with it over the long term. But it doesn't influence decisions in other parts of government. So, as you say, ageing better is one of the grand challenges. But do I think the industrial strategy influences the policy of the health department or the social care funding regime or the broader kind of fiscal regime? No, I don't think it does. So, are there countries... But why? Why? Well, I think it's, as you say, it's partly to do with departmentalism because the industrial strategy is a Bayes thing. You know, when the Industrial Strategy Council first met, the Chancellor was there, the Prime Minister was there to underline the fact that it was a kind of collective effort. But it's very hard in Whitehall. I mean, one of the characteristics of Whitehall and of Britain is that we're a very centralised country politically, very little yeah. power in local government, but actually rather devolved within Whitehall. You know, the different departments are kind of fiefdoms. So are there countries that have genuinely put industrial strategy at the very heart of economic policy making as a whole and fiscal policy as a whole, rather than what we've done, which is to do something pretty good, but kind of, you know, safely at the margins, as it were? So I think, I mean, I don't like ever to say any one country is doing everything perfectly, because that's just a lie. I personally work a lot with organizations because I think even in the UK, there's been some public organizations, whether we look at GDS in the past, Government Digital Services, the BBC right now with this really interesting debate about public value um, or and other organizations that really teach us so much of what it means to both govern and work again around this concept of the common good public interest. Um, what Where I have found inspiration in recent years has been in countries like Denmark, for example, where by having city level really interesting ambitions around you know sustainable cities like in Copenhagen, what's then happened is that the startup scene there isn't just startups for the sake of startups, right? This idea that somehow just being small and new is good in and of itself, but how it ended up interacting with, you know, kind of a manufacturing base around the green economy. So Denmark today, as fruit of actually having really ambitious and I would call mission oriented um, innovation strategies around the climate area has become the number one provider of high tech green services, services to China and China spending 1.7 trillion on greening its economy around many different um, submissions, including energy friendly technologies. And so I, I just think it's so interesting where you see this kind of combination of, yes, new services, but not services like here, where it's purely financial services, which are, you know, it's hard to turn a hedge fund into a ventilator with a defense procurement act, for example, right? So actually having a manufacturing base, but having a manufacturing base that, again, interacts with new types of services and around a government-led mission, but not a top-down mission where government is actually telling, you know, the private sector what to do, but really setting a direction that then fuels that bottom-up experimentation. Similarly, as I mentioned in Germany, the fact they had an Energiewende mission, which is not perfect, of course, there's been some problems with it. It fundamentally structured how the government interacted, even through its public bank, the KFW, with sectors like steel when they needed help. Again, having much more that confidence to even put conditionalities. Why? Well, we're all in it together to steer growth in a particular way. And just coming back to the UK, you know, the kind of raw material that we have underneath us has a lot to do with also ownership. When you have something like 84% of care beds currently in private hands, of which a big percentage of that is owned by private equity, which, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that private equity is very short-term oriented, wanting, you know, basically focused on short-term profits, not some sort of long-run public good uh, measure. You know, that's a choice this country made. It doesn't have to go that way. 
Um, and so the problem is that even then when you have a crisis, it's not just about throwing money at the NHS, it's how do we actually really rethink the structures that we have and what's a more interesting partnership, of course, with the private sector, but that doesn't mean necessarily ownership. It means how do you govern a system and you know, along the entire way, as I mentioned with vaccine, that has to do with how you govern the, the intellectual property rights um, to deliver for citizens. And I think we have so much, we have really suffered a lot in the UK if you look at how public transport was governed, public health, and also public education. And using this crisis, not just as a bashing instrument to say, oh God, look how terrible everything is and how long it will take to recover, but to say, okay, we absolutely have to change. We have to change now, both to prevent a next crisis, which could you know, be around climate, finance, or health, but also to really have the tools on the ground that we need and the relationships. I come back to this issue of relationship. When I mentioned Davos, there the issue was purpose at the corporate governance level. I think we need purpose at the governance, also public governance level, but especially purpose in how public and private interact. So a purposeful system. And that means literally getting into the nitty gritty of how you know, how we set up contracts, um, as well as the much more interesting thing is, you know, who's at the table when we talk about sustainable cities. You shouldn't have workers, for example, just having to react to that with the notion of the just transition. You really need to bring citizens and citizen engagement to the table to even define the missions themselves, whether they be around digital health or climate. So, Mario, it's been incredibly important thoughts there around the scope for synergy mission, intentionality, joining up in policy and the scope to do things differently, but not on the basis of kind of whim, but on the fact that other countries and other places are already doing this stuff and we should have the confidence to do it. Thank you so much for providing your time. I, I think these arguments, as I say, are finely poised in Whitehall. So we just have to hope that ministers and civil servants have, uh, have, have, have watched uh, this session and heard what you've had and to say. And just one thing, uh, we're working on this in South Africa in Italy with the COVID task force, but also with the Vatican. So the Pope himself, the Pope is interested in this and actually did a rave review of my book. Isn't that cool? Best thing you can ask for. God praise the book. Um, but with the Vatican, we're doing weekly briefings and I wanna start making these public. Currently they're um, mainly for the Vatican to inform the Pope's own statements on what kind of society we need to build post COVID. But I do think that there's so much to learn around the world of what works, what doesn't, and using this opportunity to really structure and bring back strategy, as you say, intention, imagination, but dreaming a better society, but doing it in the now, you know, what better moment? And, and we can't fail. We have to try. Well, that's brilliant. I was going to suggest to people, Mariana, that they could visit your website to find out more about your work. And, okay. and, and fortuitously, your name is behind your head. So if you want to see Marianne's work, you just have to type that in and type that into Google and you will go to her website and you can find out a lot more about her. Um, a quick reminder to everybody watching to stay tuned to the RSA's channels for all the latest online events, podcasts and information um, about our work. So finally, thank you once again, Marianne Mazzucato. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.